So I want to welcome everyone to this program with you, uh, Brother Daniel. And um, yeah, I have heard rumors that so much is going on in your life that the Lord is blessing abundantly. And we are so much looking forward for you sharing with us. So uh, please, the time is yours. Well, I'm glad to be here and thank you so much for having me. And um, well, I'm going to pray with you all and then I'm going to share a little bit of what it is that God has been doing in my life on behalf of what um, uh, this is a request, by the way. Thank you so much, Eva, for asking me to share this. And so let's pray together. We'll invite the Lord to lead us in our thinking. Lord of heaven, I want to thank you that you have done so much for us in the work that you have given us to do. I pray that you would please remind me of some of those things that you have revealed in the last even couple of months. And we are so thankful that you have blessed us with this technology to be able to interact from so far away. We do pray that you would bless us that in this recalling of your work, that we would recognize that we are interacting and co-working with you. Thank you for this and bless us, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, the Psalm 118, verse 23 says, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And so when we're considering what it is that God is doing in our lives, we must know that it is not we that are doing those works. It's very clear that even in the life of Jesus, we could see that God was doing those works. I'm going to share my screen real quick after I find a verse, and you can remember this verse pretty well when it says in Acts 2, verse 22, you men of Israel, hear these words, and I always say it's easy to memorize because 2, 22, that's why I say that. You men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. So the men of Israel knew that God is the one that did the works. God did those works by his son in the midst of all of them. So that's why he was able to say, you guys know this. And so when we're looking at this idea of God doing works, it's not something that we do in and of ourselves, right? And I just want to make sure that everybody understands that when we tell our testimony, when I share my testimony, I am talking about what God is doing through his servant. And there was a while ago, I did a message <clears throat> entitled, What is the Spirit of Prophecy? If you haven't seen that one, you might be interested. It shows the communication network between heaven and earth. And very clearly, we see all throughout the Bible, the Father speaks through the Son, through the ministration of angels through the prophets to people like you and me. And then it's our job to continue that conversation to other people who will then reveal that same message to other people, to other people, to other people. This is what I believe is the heaven wrought evangelism that every one of us is supposed to be involved in. And so I'm just relaying the message that God has given to me through some of his servants and myself included. But there is a story from Naik Naik is in India. We work together. I've been there. It wasn't, uh, but just before COVID, I was there and we were interacting with sharing together in front of likely 250 pastors. Could have been more, could have been less. I think it was about 250 different pastors. And they were mostly, for the most part, Pentecostal. We were able to share the truths with them without holding anything back. I was speaking as plainly to them as I would to you or to anybody else who was interested to learn. They loved it. They accepted the message. They wanted to understand. They looked forward to learning more. They've called us back. I haven't been back yet because I don't trust the governments at this point yet. And But I'm, I'm thinking, I'm planning, I'm praying. So um, when we were there, we had this amazing experience with all these different pastors. Well, the news started getting out that, hey, Naik can teach you what it is the Bible says in the book of Daniel or Revelation, some of the prophecies things like the one true God, what is the spirit, the ministration of the angels, the prophecies of the Antichrist, etc. Well, pa Pastor Naik is still able to minister in different ways to those various pastors. He was just telling me through an audio message the other day 
that he, it's 13 minutes or else I would just play the whole thing for you. But he was able to speak uh, to a pastor who came, who used to be a Catholic priest. Used to be, I say, because he recently was cast out of his synagogue. They have returned, retaliated against the message he has learned. Because what he did is he came and he learned from Naik some of the things that the Bible teaches. He learned about the Father and the Son. One night as he was in bed, he learned from a dream that he was given that he needs to worship, this, this Catholic priest needs to worship on the seventh-day Sabbath in honor of the Father and his Son. And what he has been learning is true. So he continued learning and continued studying. He went back and told his family, or rather his church family, what it is that he was learning. And as a result, the board met and they decided to cast him out. Well, that, of course, is in the making because it just recently happened, but it's all of something going on, which I believe will cause another revival there in India. There is already so much going on. For example, when we were there in India teaching about the state of the dead, what happens when you die to these pastors, they picked it up very clearly. There was never anybody except for one man who was not Seventh-day Adventist, the two Adventist pastors that did come, they were the ones that were, you know, barking and saying, you know, what about, what about third person, you know, that kind of stuff. But all of the people just studying the Bible had no questions at all, none of them, except for one guy on the message of the second coming. Well, anyways, these people, when they learn, this is, I'm telling you this because Naik is still sharing with these folk, when they learn something from the Bible, they will congregate together afterwards and discuss the idea of, did you think that was true? Yes, that's what the Bible's saying. I can read it right there in our own language. That's what the Bible's teaching. Well, then what we need to do is share next week with all of our churches these things, because this is truth. And so it keeps on going. The, the revelation just keeps on going and going. Just like I was saying in Revelation 1 verse 1, the message comes from the Father to the Son, through the angels, to the prophets, to you or to Naik and to those pastors who bring it to those members, who bring it to their families and their neighbors and et cetera, et cetera. That's how the gospel is going to go around the world, kind of like COVID did a couple of years back. So Naik is actually working with this priest, and he was, um, you know, he, he denies now the tradition, the ideology, the humanistic theory of the Trinity, because he has seen in the Bible, and he has been given a vision, and he has studied more for himself, and he is convicted that what he has learned is true. This is exciting. Let me tell you about Pastor Onyongo. Pastor Onyongo is a minister over in Kenya. You may have seen his testimony. I put it up not too long ago. It was in response to the short video. I think it was under three minutes where I sent it out to, and I put some money behind it so it would go as far as possible. And it has been watched many, many thousands of times, tens and tens of thousands of times. I don't know. I'd have to go and look now. But the video was seen many, many times. And I asked in the video for people to send this video, which was the three-minute video, to as many pastors as they know who they believe to be honest Bible students, because I wanted to give them an opportunity to go through five videos that I request of my own that I put together, and I would be willing to pay them for their time because they're professionals, they're busy, and so I'm just remunerating for their work. And they would be able to study for themselves these things. And then if they had a video interview with me for one to two hours, then I would give them the full $1,000 that I was offering them. Well, I knew immediately that very few would, would take that. It'd be like the same idea of sending out that offer saying, hey, if you can give me one scripture that shows the solemnity was changed from Saturday to Sunday in the Bible, then I'll give you a million bucks. You know, you've heard that go around for thousands of times over the many years that it's been uh, offered. Nobody can do that. Nobody's ever given anybody a million dollars because of that. So this idea of giving a, the pastors a thousand bucks for going through these five videos to then answer with a, an honest interview, I didn't think would go very far. So far, there have been three pastors, one of which has totally accepted it. The other one, the second one, no, the first one didn't fully accept it, although he said this isn't really happening much with my church or the people I know, so it's not an issue for us. But thank you for the offer. I've learned a lot, and I want to learn more. The next guy, he said, I'm in. This is amazing. I have learned as a ton of things, and I want to learn and understand more. That was actually with um, Tibeso in Ethiopia. And then another one here with um, Eli. This is Pastor Onyongo. He has accepted the message. 
And what he did, I want to share this with you because it's really, really important for us to know and understand that this is not only happening in Kenya, but also in Ethiopia. I'll try to remember both. In Kenya, the pastor who learned from this servant called Eli, he is the one that's going to minister to Muslims, and he teaches the one true God to the Muslims after he learned it with people like myself. Then he says, this is the way to go to the Muslims. And you're like, yes, it is, because now you're talking the same language using the Bible. Instead of trying to convert them to something that doesn't exist, which they reject in being the Trinity. Anyways, Eli was working with that pastor. And the pastor, after we learned it, he and I uh, communicated, and then he interviewed with me. He told me, I think it was after the interview, that he decided he was going to take his church and call them for a two-day fasting Bible study. And it was only a couple of, maybe maybe two weeks after we did the Bible study, uh, the interview together, rather. So he called his church to fast for two days, studying the Bible with him, and coming to a point of decision based on what it is the Bible says. So to my understanding, he had, I don't remember, I think it was 40 plus people that came. I can't recall. I'd have to look at the notes because this is kind of a newer thing that's coming to my head after reading the notes that I put down. And to my knowledge, they accepted the message. Now, I would have to get more specifics on that from him, like how many people have gone back and forth and what's going on. But I'm going to communicate with him now that I've shared with you. Anyways, that was the approach is he went to his people fasting and praying, studying the Bible, asking for them to help him understand whether what he has been learning is true or false. So another one that I just learned about was um, from Tibeso. No, first let me tell you, yeah, Tibeso. That's the other one in Ethiopia. He was, Tibeso was telling me just a couple of days back, maybe a week or two back, that one of the pastors he's been studying with has come to the point where he decided he was going to stay up all night and study. He wanted to know what the Bible said. So after six or eight hours of studying that night, he came back to Tibeso and said, I believe this is what the Bible teaches. And so now he, who knows where he is, I don't know his name or, or what he's doing, but he is going to be influencing a lot of people. That's exciting to me because I know as a pastor, when God has already called you to serve in a public forum, and you turn toward him in a greater way with more light and more power behind your words, it affects people. And I'm praising God for that. So Tibeso just this morning, about three hours ago, told me that he has been, um, oh, what was that story? He told me just this morning, he's been interacting with somebody, oh yes, a pastor that he has been speaking with, a different one, he was just yesterday, he was telling me that, well, today he told me that just yesterday they were talking together and they had a five hour conversation where the pastor was saying, if you don't believe the Holy Spirit is a third separate being, then I don't even want to talk to you. So Tibeso said, now, wait a minute, I have a question for you. Your business, your job is to save the lost. Is that right? The pastor said, yes, of course. He says, well, then you should be focusing on me. I should be your attention right now, because if you think what I'm teaching is bad or wrong, and it's causing my uh, a loss of salvation, then your interest should be in me, right? And the pastor was like, okay, right. Okay, sure. So they studied for five full hours. And now the pastor isn't converted, but he certainly has a lot of things to think about. Tibeso is a very sharp thinker, and God led us together to be able to work together from here, and he's in Ethiopia. And so that is really exciting. And I'm, I'm just praising God that these things are happening literally right now, like two weeks ago, three weeks ago, yesterday. Okay, like last night, I personally was in my house right here with a pastor friend of mine. And the other week we were hiking together. And so I asked him, I said, so I have a, a hunch that you and your wife are interested in the subject of God compared to the Trinity. Is that true? I was mainly asking for his wife's sake because I know he's interested. And she, he said, interested? No way. We are in. We get it. We have so much been blessed by the things that we have learned, right? That was last week. So this weekend, uh, yesterday, they were at my house. And so uh, the wife was sitting across from me 
And she goes, and we're around a whole bunch of people that are not non-Trinitarian. These are Trinitarian folk from the local church that came over last night to fellowship with us. And so she asks me a question. She says, according to Matthew chapter 4, the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness for to be tempted for 40 days. If the Spirit isn't a being, what does that mean? Now, I already know that she's interested. She's just curious, okay? So she's actually appealing for truth, and that's what I was gathering from her question. So God gave me the okay to just open up and share. In fact, I said to her just last night, I said, you are asking a very deep question, and so I'm going to go right down to the depth. Is that okay? And she was like, yeah. So I said, okay, the spirit leading Christ into the wilderness is the what? But now we have to ask the how. I said, Christ was given communication direct from heaven. That's why John in chapter 3, at the end, John the Baptist was able to say, the spirit of Christ was given unto him without measure. What does that mean? Well, Jacob saw what was happening with this ladder going from heaven to earth, right? The father was up on top of the ladder. The son represented the ladder, and angels were ascending and descending to the prophet, which is Jacob, who needed to be able to understand what was coming in the future. And so this um, illustration Christ used at the end of John, uh, John chapter 1, in verse 51, saying to Nathanael, you're going to see the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Well, then I backed up and said, let's look a little bit more at that story just in our minds. Nathaniel was under a tree. He was having devotions. He was praying, and he was called by his friend to go over and visit with Jesus. So Jesus, when he sees Nathaniel, says, hey, this is an Israelite in whom is no guile. And he was like, how do you know me? He says, I saw you before you even came, but when you were under that tree. And he knew that nobody knew that he was under that tree because he was at such a distance. So he says, you must be the Messiah. You must be the king of Israel. And Jesus asked, are you really excited about what you just learned? You're going to learn more things than this. You're going to learn actually how that happened. You're going to have eyes open and the son of, you're going to see the son of man with angels ascending and descending upon him. So really what Jesus did was explain how he knew that Nathaniel was under that fig tree before Nathaniel even came to explain to him that he knew. So Nathaniel was really excited. Jesus explains these things. And I was saying, so when Christ needed help in the wilderness of temptation, which is what we're talking about, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. What did God do to send strength to him in verse 11? And the husband and the wife, they looked at each other and they said, he sent an angel. I said, exactly. So the how is the communication network that God has established. He speaks, the angels ascend and descend upon the Son of Man, which is the angel, and they relay the message to the prophet. And so the same thing happened to Jesus. Because of Christ's faithfulness, by promise, Christ was that ladder, and the angels were able to ascend and descend upon the Son of Man, which is the ladder. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 1, verse 51. And so I said, there's a message that I have, which is the second part I did in the camp meeting over there in Pennsylvania, which was this last year. It's called How to Finish the Work, a Biblical Example. It's the part two. And I said, I can send that to you. So I did. I sent that to them, and hopefully they're going to be watching that soon. Anyways, another pastor friend and wife are interested, and they even said not just interested, but all in. So this is really exciting. This is not far from where I am now, and hopefully I'll be able to work together with this dear person. This is not another pastor that I've told you about before. Well, I don't know about you, but I've told somebody about another pastor not far away from my, where I am. He has already resigned his position. The enemy is seeming to work with him right now, so please pray. I would love to work with him and the other friend that I had at my house just last night so that we could work together. We're not far from each other. I literally am within a very short distance of a drive from these folk. So we could like literally work together in a way that I think would answer the question that I've had for a full year now. God, why did you lead me into Georgia? And he just might have a bigger plan than I could realize. Anyways, pray for that. And um, let's see. That's, yep, there we go. So let me tell you about Tibeso a little bit more. Tibeso, he interacted with me online. And I know how it is in a lot of cases, not all of them, but a lot of cases when you get a message from somebody in Africa, whatever country, whatever uh, province of Africa, well, country of Af Africa is in the continent. So whether it be South Africa, 
Ethiopia, Kenya, uh, Tanzania, or Malawi, that people have interacted quite a bit. I'm immediately suspicious because I know that these people will very often reach out for a moment, praise God, thank you, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, we're praying for you, please give me money, please give me money. And I don't like that. I think that they need to learn a better kind of interaction where you can build trust and then you can start working together. Well, Tibeso, he reached out to me. He said, hey, I'm learning from your videos. I said, oh yeah, really? What am I teaching? And he responded, this is what you're teaching. Do you have ways I can minister with you? Like we can meet online. I said, well, I've got these meetings on the weekend. Please come. Well, he showed up like all the time. And pretty soon I was realizing that, man, he's a student because when he answers, he answers well. And he doesn't answer with just like, you know, the normal uh, stuff that you spit out. You can find that he's been studying himself and he is a diligent student. So I recognized like, okay, this guy really is doing something. Tibeso, I contacted him. What are you doing for ministry? Well, I'm busy. I work all the time and we have weekends. We're, I'm trying to share in my church, but they're not wanting to hear. I said, have you thought about a camp meeting? And he says, well, no, not really, but, but I'll think about that. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to test the waters a little bit with you see what happens. I, I would like to fund a camp meeting for you. If you gather together people that you know that are within the area that could potentially come to a series of meetings that you do and talk about the Father and the Son, we'll see how that works. Well, for him to rent the building, buy the food, offer people transportation, because you have to do that in other countries. They can't just buy themselves a plane ticket, not a plane ticket, sorry, a bus ticket, and be able to get to where you want them to go. You have to pay for that because these people don't have the extra. They have time in many cases, but not the funds. And so you pay for their food, you pay for their place to sleep, you pay for their um, travel. And there was like, I think like 18, I don't remember, but 18 or so people that came. Well, he was able to share with them. Nobody seemed to take the bait. They all just kind of backed off and didn't want to say much. Well, Tobeso after a while was kicked out of his church. They didn't want to fellowship with him. They didn't want to hear from him. He couldn't, he couldn't go without like, having the same kind of stuff I get over here when you show up into a church and they're like, oh man, the heretic showed up. You know, they don't want to shake your hand. They don't want to give you love, et cetera. It's a little awkward. Anyways, um, well, that's what, that was what was going on with him. Well, continue two years later, and now he is sharing with people all the time. He's in groups online. He's sharing through WhatsApp. He's printing stuff. He's distributing literature. He's preaching in the, the local churches on the weekends. He's interacting with pastors. He's now like, got a group of people is actually working with somebody who's working with him full time. And uh, I don't think he works anymore full time. I think um, we've been able to fund him to the point where he's able to not only help others, but also do stuff for himself, which is praise God. You know, I'm, I'm so thankful for that. But the work has been started there and it is it is literally exploding. Like there's a pastor just yesterday and last week and, and the one I interviewed, these guys are really interested in learning more about what God is saying about himself. So pray for Tibeso, pray for Nayi, pray for Eli, pray for the pastor Onyongo, pray for uh, Kojak, Corey Jackson, the one, the other pastor I was interviewing. And so Sammy over in Kenya, he's another one that works together with Zadok at Gospel Sounders. They're constantly doing stuff. They're, they're printing materials distributing, having weeks of prayer, they're having revivals, they're doing health messages, they're constantly traveling. Um, Sammy just a few days ago told me that in the next five to six weeks, they will be traveling to do mission work and present series of meetings. Now, what does that mean? When I was there personally in Kenya, I was able to see for myself the young people that not like 30 and 40 year old young people, these are like mid-teens, later teens, and 20s, okay? Some 30s, not very many, but mostly later teens and 20s. These folk, when you ask them about anything, they will give you the Bible and the writings of Ellen White response. And then you ask them, like, where did you learn that from? They're like, we just, we study, we, we pray, we find for ourselves what the Bible is saying. And you're like, have you ever heard from, and you name some of these people online, which actually teach differently? They're like, no, I, I have never heard of them before some of the one true God teachers. And you're like, whoa, these guys are being led by God. This is amazing. And so when Sammy, who's, um, I think he's 40 now, so he's one of the elder, but when he goes out and does mission work, he's actually working with young people, like mid uh, teens and older, and then twenties. 
And these folk are literally taking the gospel to their areas. There's another guy um, that I um, can't remember his name, John Mark. John Mark is also in Kenya. These are these are different places in Kenya. Ellie's in Kenya, Sami and Zadok are in Kenya, which are separated, but they work together. And then um, um, John Mark is in Kenya as well. Well, he's a young guy. He's like just getting out of high school, but he has been teaching his local students the one true God message. They have cast him out of churches. They have told him he can't come back to school. He had to actually go to a different school and they wouldn't let him go in unless he was paid for. So I was able by God's grace to give him a very minimal amount for school compared to over here. Okay. So over here, like school's a lot over there. It just, it was minimal. Anyways, I paid for a year of school for him and he has been able to go there. They, they are now starting to invite him. Just was it today or yesterday? I heard from him that they have asked him to come back a second time to a local church to be able to share more of what it was that he was able to share a little bit before, which is very unusual for him because normally they're just telling him to stay away. Anyways, in his area, it's starting to come up and revive again as well. So it's amazing. It's I, I can't even give you the details. I just know the basics of what's happening. There was another group that I, um, this I think was also in Kenya, it was a group that I interviewed a while back. I don't even remember the names of these people. It's been too long, only like a year ago, maybe, but it, that's still too long in my head because I've got so much going on all the time. But this man took a sermon on a USB. He plugged it into a computer at a church. The church had about 100 people, and they listened to one of the messages that I presented about God. And there was such a uprising in that church about what the Bible says about God. 50 of them decided they are not coming back. And they told the local elder, and they said, you can take the Trinity and give it back to the Catholics. And until you do that, we are not coming back. And so there was this great split there in the church. And I don't know what's going on. I haven't even remembered that story for so long until I'm sharing it with you. But that's the kind of stuff that's happening, and we don't even know about it. This, this is going on all over the place. And so we praise God for these things. Now, regarding what I'm doing locally, I'm constantly working with people as much as I can. The other day, I was at a gas station. I, I'm riding a bike. It's an electric bike. Somebody actually financially helped me to get one. And I was, I'm so blessed I have that. It's just amazing. It's, it's really a tool for people to start asking you questions, and then you can quickly turn it over to the providence of the Lord, how he provided it for you, and you're telling where you live, and yeah, you're going to be planting a church, and I'm a pastor, I study the Bible, can I pray with you, you know, all that stuff. Anyways, I'm over at this uh, gas station on this bicycle. I had just gotten it like literally three days before. So this guy says, hey, I saw you the other day riding up this hill. That's an electric bike, isn't it? I said, yes, it sure is. And he says, uh, man, I could tell because your legs aren't that powerful. I said, well, I got something in there, but not that much because, you know, you're coming up these hills actually moving pretty quick. And uh, so we started talking and he asked what I was doing in Georgia, having been from California. He can tell I'm not from this area because I don't have the accent. And so I started speaking about the fact that God had led us here providentially. He answered our prayers. He got us this place. I live right down here on this um, road that's not too far away. And he says, wow, that's great. Well, you're a pastor, huh? I said, yeah, I am. Yes, I, I do a lot online because I've moved from California. I don't have a local church right now. He says, well, um, I've got a question then for you. Why is there so much information going on about the uh, pastors and the like, right-wing Christians trying to support Trump to get him back into office? And I said, well, I'll tell you why. It's Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18. And he smiled like, man, this guy goes straight to the Bible. Well, yeah, I did. In fact, God opened up my mind so that I could share with him very, very plainly about what was going on with COP27, which was just a few days later. This was just a couple of days before that. This was, I think, November 11 or 10, and COP27 happened on the uh, 13th. But I was telling him about that. I was explaining the Bible prophecies. I went through the history of the uh, Dark Ages and how the Catholic Church had rule over all these people. The missionaries went out and spread the false doctrines. I didn't say which ones except for spiritualism, but there's uh, the three major false doctrines. There's the Sunday sacredness, there's spiritualism, or you know the, etern the uh, immortality of the soul, and there is the tradition of the Trinity. Those three doctrines have been spread, spread all over the world as a result of those missionaries coming out of the Dark Ages. That's why you, in your area, 
could go to a local church and learn about the Trinity. It's because and Sunday sacredness and the fact that the soul never dies because of the missionaries that have come forth from the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Anabaptists, the um, Presbyterians, etc., the Catholics. So, um, anyways, I was sharing a lot of these things, not quite as much as I just shared with you, but with him. And he was so interested. He says, man, I really want to check this stuff out. I want to learn more. Could you have a link that I can send you? Well, I know that just the week before, Robert, or two weeks before, had mentioned something on the page that I had about COP27. So I asked him for a link. He sent it to me. I sent it to him. Unfortunately, I haven't heard back from that guy, but I know those seeds were planted and he was very interested. So pray for people like that. This happens all the time around my area. I'm constantly able to interact with people and share with them about the Lord because I just want to. As soon as I talk to you, I want it to be a spiritual conversation. I want to talk about the Bible. I want to talk about prophecy. I want to talk about the Spirit of Christ. Well, I've also been visiting local churches here, not Seventh-day Adventist churches. They don't want me to come much at all, so I go there kind of out of necessity. But what I do is I visit these Sunday churches, and I either do that on a Sunday which today I can't because I'm here with y'all, or I go on a midweek meeting. And some of the meetings I've had have been so unimpressive. Like one of them was so few people there with the music so loud. And the pastor's wife was really trying to do everything she can to genuflect and show you that she's full of the spirit. You know, she was just really, really trying to show you that she had the spirit within her. Anyways, I could see the what I felt was fake and just kind of a show. She and the pastor were there. The pastor was on the guitar playing and singing, and it was just so loud. It was so fake, it seemed, that I actually left early. Well, not too long after that, I went to the Presbyterian church, not too far away. And no, sorry, it was a different church, not Presbyterian. And so when I went there, it was so dry and so ritualistic, so traditional. Everybody stands, everybody quotes something, everybody sits down, everybody speaks after the pastor. Um, it just, he didn't seem to have the love, the patience, the desire for the spirituality. It just was, it was like something that you did. And I felt it was so dry that if I was there too long, something was going to catch fire and I was going to be in trouble. But um, he started talking about how if you read Matthew, uh, sorry, John chapter 2, and you don't see that Jesus made actual wine, then you're not really reading the Bible. So when I heard this from that guy, I just said, you know what, I don't need to be here. So I left. And that that's, I think the only time heads turned is when I was leaving, because otherwise everybody was just so rigid and so like focused on the um, rituals that they were supposed to be doing. It, it was strange. So I went to another church, heard a good sermon, actually. Um, I didn't go back because I looked up online at the pastor on some of his online messages, and he was such a goof that I felt like maybe I'll interact with him some other time, but I want to find somebody a little more mm, focused and a little more serious. So um, I've gone to another church. I asked the pastor to meet with me and eat together. But he didn't respond after the second time I called. I think he may have uh, heard from another pastor, the one that I asked about the uh, messages on the Trinity, asked him for an interview. He said he would do it. He accepted the invitation. He watched the first message. He said, nope, not going to do it. And he gave me a whole list of reasons why he backpedaled and said, no, it wouldn't be good for you. It wouldn't be good for the church. It would be good for us. So anyways, this other pastor, I think, talked to him. And then he won't communicate with me yet unless I go back over there, and I might. Such a small congregation. The guy's really old, and I don't know if that's really the best place to be at this point. Anyways, there's this other one where I've been. And the first time I was there, maybe the second, there was a conversation going on. And it was a good sermon. The, the lay pastor who is taking over as an interim pastor because the actual pastor took a call somewhere else. So he's just there in the meantime, or the nice time, depending on how you want to think about it. But so what happens is um, he was reading through one of the Corinthians. And I don't remember, is it 1 Corinthians 2 or 2 Corinthians 2? I don't remember. Sorry. I think it's 2 Corinthians 2, where the pastor was reading that we cannot know the mind of God. 
the man knows what's in the mind of man, but only God knows what's in his mind. It's not revealed to man. But then it later says, but we have the mind of Christ. And so he asked, how is it that we can't know what's in the mind of God, but we do know what's in the mind of Christ? And I heard that as a non-Trinitarian question. I was like, I, I get this. I can, I can answer this question. And so I was over there like, you know, casually raising my hand. And he says, yes, sir. I said, may I? He says, oh, please. I said, well, I've, I've actually considered this quite some time. I've done a lot of study on this subject. So if you don't mind, I'll take just a moment to go through a couple of thoughts. Well, God just gave me scripture that all just linked together. And it was a, I felt like a very balanced and inspiring answer. How that Christ, the son of the living God, took on flesh, was divinity clothed with humanity, and as a result, made us compatible with the spirit of his father. And then we, as it says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, have been given the spirit of Christ, which is in our hearts crying, Abba, Father. And then we have now the ability to have the mind of Christ, which was in Christ Jesus. It was the mind of the Father. So I didn't say it quite as well, but it all came together when I was there. And you can see as a result of God working and speaking through his servant, they were like looking at each other going, yeah. And so they, well, thank you. That was, that was very interesting. And so I haven't been back yet, except I tried, but they had a business meeting. So I left. I haven't been back yet, but pray that I will have an opportunity to continue to put in little seeds like that, that are beyond their understanding. I know that they don't have those thoughts because they're Trinitarian and it's just, you Trinitarians don't think that way. And so uh, for the most part, I can't say totally, but I, I know a lot of them. Anyways, that was my experience with the local churches in the area. And I'm still trying to do that not because I want to try to learn from them. I want to try to plant seeds and see how I can mingle and interact with these folk because otherwise I don't feel like I can. I do a lot of walking in my area. I walk nearly every single day. Haven't been able to do that today yet. But what happens is people recognize me at the local store or at the grocery or, or when I'm riding my bicycle or something like, hey, you're, you're the guy that walks around, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do that because I love spending time with the Lord and I walk and pray in the morning. Oh yeah, that's great. You're, you're, a, you're a Christian. Oh yeah. Well, do you go to church? And I'll tell them a well, lot. Not really right now. Cause I just moved from California. Come on, come to our church. And that's part of why I started wanting to visit is because people will invite you to your church. So if you're obliged to go because you want to be able to be a friend to this person, Ellen White says you ought to go not for the purpose of being there just to fellowship, but so that you can be, how would you say a, a blessed thorn in the flesh. Can I say it that way? So we're trying to plant a church here. It's a 10 building. It's going to be a 50 by 50, which will also be like a kind of a multi-purpose building, if you will. And we got a, an amazing deal. It's supposed to be this much, but I appealed to this company and said, hey, I want a building 50 by 50 by 18. And they said, if you wouldn't mind changing the, um, the uh, length or height of that building a little bit, we could give you a price, what would they call a liquidation price? I was like, really? Okay, what do you got? Instead of 50 by 50 by 18, they wanted to give me a 15 by 50, uh, sorry, 50 by 50 by 20. I'm like, okay. And they gave that, not gave, but they offered that building at one quarter of the price less than the original price. And so immediately I thought, okay, God's in this, I'm doing it. And so they're going to be delivering that building and we're working on getting people to put it together, et cetera. And so uh, all these things are happening and it's just, there's so much going on so fast. It's hard to remember all the details. Like I try to write a monthly newsletter and if I don't write specific things that happen at the time that they happen, I don't remember that they happened unless I go back and try to find random emails from either WhatsApp or Telegram or Instagram or, you know, um, email or texting or phone call, just all those different ways that people try to interact. Even through Zoom, sometimes people will send you private messages and it's hard to put them all together. So some of those things I include in the newsletters, but it's kind of hard not to, or to uh, remember everything. Now, recently I went to the Parthenon. I just let out a video a couple of days back where it was a 360 video of the Parthenon. What is the Parthenon? Well, Ellen White prophesied 
Well, rather, Ellen White was given a vision of Nashville, Tennessee, when she was there. She saw that the area was destroyed by fall, uh, balls of fire, and the balls of fire would somewhat like explode, okay? And when you see what she re what she saw and wrote, and then you realize Nashville has this Parthenon, which was actually rebuilt in the 1980s, but it's a 41-foot idol. It's a statue. And this woman goddess has not only a shield by her side, but a big spear in her hand. I think it is. I'd have to see that again. But there's a serpent that's between her and the shield. So she's protecting the serpent. And she also has in her right hand a six foot four angel. When you look in the video, the angel looks tiny, but it's as tall as I am. And if you've been around me, a lot of people say, wow, you look a lot taller in person than you do on the video. I'm a tall guy, six foot, almost four. So that angel is as tall as I am. And when I saw the angel as small as it looked, I thought, man, that's as tall as I am. Wow, that looks so small. Anyways, it's a really big like idol. And it's inside this Roman kind of structure. When you do a little homework on, and see what it was that Ellen White saw and prophesied, you realize, wow, this is very interesting because it could very well be that she was talking about those buildings where this idol of 41 foot tall is that will be destroyed by balls of fire falling from heaven. So do a little homework on that and see if you might be interested to see the 360 video, which actually takes you in where you can look around anytime you want in the video. And I was just holding a, a 360 camera and you can kind of look around and see for yourself. If you can't go there, that's kind of like the next best, next best thing for being there is going in a virtual tour, if you will. So that's available if you're interested. My son, he's on a mission trip. He's in Thailand. He's been going through all sorts of emotional and um, interesting times. His friend was just the other day on a scooter, moped. They were going about 50 miles an hour. And my son was behind his friend. His My uh, son's friend hit a dog at that speed, flipped over, landed in the middle of the asphalt, ruined the bike. He's all bruised up and somewhat bloody. And my son freaked out like that. That was a big deal to watch his friend like flip in front of him at 50 miles an hour on this moped. Anyways, that just happened recently, but they're doing well. They're struggling with trying to figure out what God is telling them to do over there in that country. They don't know a lot of people. It's, it's a little disorganized for them compared to what they were thinking all that stuff that comes with being in the ministry. So my son is growing exponentially over there, I'm sure. My daughter, she's helping over here in uh, various different ways. She is working with uh, my wife who does ministry with her friends in the area and they're doing well. They're, they're so blessed. In fact, my, my wife is coming home because her uncle just died the other day, which unfortunate just happened. And uh, so pray for my family that the Lord will continue to lead us. As mentioned, my mother is still struggling against cancer. We're juicing for her. We're giving her whole foods, high doses of vitamin C, hyperbaric chamber. She's eating raw. She's doing exercise, vitamins, mineral, water treatments, et cetera. So there's so many things that's going on with them as well, with her. And, uh, oh, yeah, I've got a note here about printing in Malawi. There's a group that contacted me from Malawi. Like, hey, we really love your stuff. This is, we've got questions. Here's what we're doing. We're trying to get this going on. And so I interacted with them, asked them several questions, had an interview with this guy in Malawi. And so we've been able to help them with a printer. And now they're able to start printing some of the stuff that I believe is doing what it can to represent the truth. And I've asked them some critical questions about some of the key doctrines that are important. And it seems as though they're on the right track. So I've been preaching in different places, preaching in Rome. Um, sorry, Roan Mountain. And that was really good because I was able to interact with some of the leaders of different ministries in a way that I normally can't do. And it seems that we are all growing and I'm thankful for that. Some of them are not, I can tell some of them are just like going to stay stuck in the mud where they are, it seems, not being negative. I'm just trying to use that as an illustration. But it also seems that other ministers, all of us, like myself included, we're all trying to grow. We're coming to better and clearer descriptions of what truth is. Some of us are a little slower than others, but I'm thankful for that. And I was really blessed to be there. So I'm preaching in Benton. Um, sometimes that can be a gathering of a lot of different beliefs. And so it's quite interesting to be there. 
I've been in Oklahoma where there's been a group that has been cast out of the synagogue, a whole two families, four people. But now the group has gathered together where they're like 14 or 15 on the weekends because some of the local saints are realizing like, wait, they, they treated you poorly. They shouldn't have done that. What's really happening? And so when they ask those questions, they're able to get good answers. And I was recently, just a couple of weeks, if not one week back, I was in Loma Linda two weeks ago, I guess. And that was a lot of fun. I preached God in Loma Linda, Jesus Christ in Loma Linda, and the Spirit in Loma Linda. Those were some of the more clear messages that I think God has given me on the Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, I didn't get much into the ministration of the angels when I was talking about the Spirit. I dealt more with the mind and how we can have the mind of Christ, which is the Spirit of Christ. And anyways, that's um, been a lot of fun. And pretty soon, well, they are online, at least the first two right now at the, I don't even remember the name of the webpage. They're on the YouTube page, but they will be on our channel pretty soon once they're finished. They're not quite complete yet. But uh, that's some of what's going on. And I'm really thankful that you've given me the opportunity to share. So now, if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to try to answer what it is that you might want to know about. Well, um, praise the Lord. Wow, it's, it's just like I'm thinking, wow, is this the start of the latter rain? I think it is. I think it's the drops of the latter rain. The message of God coming to us is the message or the uh, latter rain. Right. So, uh, yeah, wow. You have very, very good. God has given you a very good memory to remember all these different places and people and experiences. And uh, so <clears throat> tell me, uh, how does it go in India? I have friends in India. Actually, I don't know if you guys uh, know uh, Bill and Louis Dow. Uh, they have been now, but they have gone over there and uh, God has used them to do a great work, um, you know, rescuing thousands and thousands of children. Uh, from, uh, you know, different, uh, um, you know, they have been misused and so on. And uh, But they are saying that people, they really want to try to stop everything which is called Christianity over there. So I'm just wondering, how, how, is, uh, how is it going with these people who are accepting the truth over there? Are they getting problems with the, you know, I mean, most of them are Christians from before, so probably it doesn't matter that much. There are locations like where Nayik is, uh, where Christianity is well accepted. There are locations, I've spoken personally with some of the pastors that came to the, to the trainings that we had, the teaching services, and they were saying that it is very difficult where they are because some Christians will lose their lives just at random. You don't really know when it's happening. And um, Pastor Nayik is actually the head of one church, which is very small, just a couple of families where the previous pastor before him was actually killed in a field by the Muslims. I'm sorry, no, 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 the Hindus. And the wife of the pastor who was a Christian later actually accepted again the Hindu faith going backwards to the faith that she originally had, and uh, which is unfortunate as well. But so where Naik is, there's not a lot of persecution at this point, but it can get that way. But we praise God that it is open right now, at least in that area. So it depends on where you're at, I think, in India. Yeah, it's so strange names. So, uh, But anyway, um, the, their daughter is going to have a um, uh, program here on Zoom into uh, the 10th of December. So you're welcome back. I mean, it's a miracle. How this, uh, he was actually educated at Wildwood. That's the only background. And they went to, they were running um, a vegan restaurant in New York for a while and a health center also in New York. And then they went to uh, India and they were walking there in the streets and they were crying when they saw all these children just laying there and, you know, being hungry and many of them were dying. And then the Lord opened the door so they could start this uh, uh, orphanage. And uh, they uh, his wife is a midwife, so they have been educated thousands of, uh, you know, young people to become pastors and sowers and midwives and so in two in the 10th of um december they're going to she's going the daughter is going to be with us here and and share but we cannot put that video on youtube because they are very afraid that the government will see it because they will just close down everything so uh, yeah so um 
Bill is actually there just to, uh, he's there on business uh, reason. And so because they are running a tofu um, uh, factory where they make tofu and soy milk and so such things. And uh, it's, um, the Lord is really blessing. Right. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I would like to hear a little bit more also about your son in Thailand. Thailand has been my kind of second home for some years. And uh, so how, how is your son and his friends somehow? How are, they, um, um, how are they coming in touch with people? They don't know the language and not many people speak English. How are they doing it? What I was told is that my son and his friend, if they have tracts which are Christian, will be able to hand those tracts to people that are local, that don't speak the English language. Those people are excited to get them because what they can do is they can start reading and learning the English language as a result when they can compare the two um, languages together. And so when you offer to teach them or read it to them or give them an, any kind of education about English speaking, they are very receptive. So that's been one of the ways they have been able to reach out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah amen. Yeah, I don't know if uh, someone else here have some questions. Um, you were talking about Kenya. I'm familiar with Sami and, and Wycliffe and, and uh, Brother Sadok, and I'm just amazed how they go from house to house and heal people in Christ's name with natural remedies and, and mm -hmm. baptize people and uh, start churches. And uh, so, amen, it's, uh, wow. You know, in Norway, it's, uh, yeah, you can witness, but it seems like not so much of the things are happening right now. But uh, um, probably one of the causes is also, you know, Sister Wise says that the church is not, uh, um, we are not ready to accept other people because of the situation in the church. Yeah, that's right. Very true. Yeah, so um, please be feel free to come with questions or comments or. Or perhaps we can meet again some other time as well. Yeah, that would be uh, very nice. So I know that six o'clock is a good time for you to do programs here or. I think so, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And um, so, uh, yeah, maybe you'd like to close with a prayer. I would like to, yes. Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you that you've given us the opportunity to meet together and to recall some of the things that you're doing. We do pray that you would please continue to have mercy on us as we want to not only be transformed by the messages that we understand, but we want to share it as well so that others will also be transformed. We give you praise and thank you that you have called us into your marvelous light. And we ask that you would continue to lead all of us, that even in Norway, where it's difficult to witness and it doesn't seem where a lot's going on, I pray that you bless Eva and people like her, that they will be able to share and trust that the seeds will be planted and grow some 30, some 60, some 100 fold when they fall into good ground. We pray that you'd continue to bless the seeds all over the world. We know that your message is going forward and with strength, and we want to be part of it. Thank you for this and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.